Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Impact Chat. Have we got a session for you? Two incredible people who are going to be a lot of fun. And I don't, I think they know each other pretty well. So um, all but walls will be broken down. My name is Kathy, and I've got the privilege of serving as founder and president of Impact. We're a completely volunteer led organisation. We have no paid staff whatsoever, and we make a difference to Victorian women and children fleeing extreme violence at home. While we're a charity, we actually don't give charity. What we do is give gifts and services with dignity, and we give dignity with gifts and services. If you're able to, please consider a tax deductible donation, which we'll be directing to our court childcare program a free service for families who need this while their parent is in court. I'm, my home sits on the land of the Bunurong peoples of the Kulin Nation. I acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of Australia, the traditional owners of the lands and waters on which we're privileged to live, work and play. Lands and waters which have never been ceded. I'd like to say this each time, but this week it's particularly important that we do with it being NADOC week. I recognise the people's continuing connection to this land, to its waters and to their communities. And I pay my respects to their peoples and to their elders past, present and emerging. Well, have we got some surprises in store for you. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Our key star is Eve Ash today. But she's in conversation with another brilliant person who might end up being key star one other one day next year, maybe, Sean Miller. Over to you, Sean. Okay, well, I'm a film and entertainment lawyer, and Eve and I have known each other for many decades, and I do Eve's legal work on her films and documentaries, including the television series Undercurrent about Sue Neil Fraser, which we're going to be talking about tonight. And Sean is also an executive producer on all my major productions. So I'm a psychologist uh, and filmmaker. I've been making films for four decades. And the biggest project of my life is all around Sue Neil Fraser, the topic uh, tonight, a woman that I didn't know prior to starting to work on the film. Okay, so... We'll, we'll delve into the Undercurrent series a little later in the chat. But first of all, Eve, how did you come to know about Sue Neil Fraser? And can you, I know it's a, a very sort of complex story, but in a way it's a simple story as well. Tell us how you came to know about Sue Neil Fraser and then we can talk about a summary of what the case involves. I invariably have really wonderful close and long relationships with many people that I work with. And one very special person happened to be the son-in-law of Sue Neil Fraser. And after a, a great career that he was building in Melbourne, he decided to go to Tasmania with his new wife. They actually got married in Tasmania um, to be near her family. And within a year, he rang me and we catch up. He rang me and he said, something awful has happened. Sarah, his wife, Sarah's stepdad has disappeared and we think he's murdered. And that was the absolute beginning. That was the first day because it's and not when often. was that? How long ago was that? It was February the 22nd, 2009. It was not even a month since he disappeared. So he disappeared in January 2009. Nine. And he disappeared off on a yacht, a yacht in, that was moored right in Hobart on the River Derwent. And his body was not found, is that correct? It's never been found. Was there day. a murder weapon found? No. And um, Sue, and, and yet Sue was charged with his murder. So tell, walk us through that because it seems like a very remote, now looking at it, all the evidence in your series in particular, Undercurry, it seems like a very remote set of circumstances that led to Sue Neil Fraser being charged and then convicted with the murder of her, um, of her 
partner, husband. Yes, of 18 years. Of 18 so years. Whether you say husband or partner, yes. they were together in a long-term relationship. Yeah. So I guess what was critical was that it was a chain of circumstances. They'd just got this yacht. It was only a month since they'd had it. They'd done yeah. a lot of shopping around for the right yacht to have family holidays. It was kind right. of their retirement mm -hmm. Uh, venue that they were going to do little trips mm -hmm. around Australia and around Tasmania and they'd just taken delivery um, not even a month before it had been sailed down from Queensland yeah and it was the very first night that Bob decided to stay on board by himself to do some electrical repairs he was a radiation um, physicist mm -hmm. and you know he was keen to kind of do things on the boat mm -hmm. and sue said look are you sure because she took the dinghy ashore which left him without a dinghy but it was only 300 meters out yeah. and he's a good swimmer and it yeah. was it's not in the ocean um, yeah it was on a mooring and, and then was it australia day his body was missing is yeah well right? what happened is that the next morning um Sue got an alarm call from the Port Authority saying your boat is sinking and she freaked out. She said, but Bob's on board and that was kind of the beginning. There was no sign of Bob. The boat was resurrected. It was it was down and severely damaged, yeah. but it hadn't yeah. gone right below the water level. Right. And um, Sue was in a state of shock and through her either shocked state or the fact that she was given Valium or the fact that she made erroneous judgments. And not she, thinking Not properly. thinking straight. She ended up saying things that were then used against her. Plus she tried to be really helpful to the police and said, look, maybe this happened or maybe that happened or maybe this happened. Right. And they developed a murder theory from her maybes. So the police ar like arrested her, interviewed her. What? Just, no, they no. did. They didn't. It happened at the end of January. They arrested her in late August that year. Ah. And they said they did a very thorough investigation. But unfortunately, the investigation was all about Sue and how it could have happened that Sue did it. So there was no thorough canvassing of neighbours who had incredible knowledge and material. Mm -hmm. um, there was, you know, there were, there, it, it turns out through our investigation that there was an, actually an eyewitness to the crime who saw what really happened. But that came years later. But at the time... Sue was said to be a liar and she was just locked up, no bail, and has been there now over 11 years, serving an original 26-year sentence reduced to 23. So the evidence against her was either remotely circumstantial or not verifiable would you say it was circum it was a totally circumstantial case because nobody put sue in the crime scene mm. um her dna wasn't there although it should be there i mean it doesn't matter that it was there or not there it's her boat yeah um a jacket of hers was found on the shore with no forensic evidence relating yeah. to a crime yeah um, and a, a lot of leads were not followed up, but there yeah. were a lot of inconsistencies that the police felt. Ultimately, it boiled down to if Sue lied in a couple of circumstances, they felt that was enough to, to convict her. To, well, to suggest that she was guilty. Yeah. And so for a long time, people like me who were questioning would always say she never had a fair trial. I don't believe that she's guilty, but mm. people wouldn't say Sue is innocent. And that has changed in the last three years. Yeah. Now, there's a lot of, as we know, in, in, in 
Australian legal history and even around the world, wrongful convictions. What drew you to this case in particular? And I know you've got a great sense of justice, but there's a lot of injustice in the world. So you can't, you know, be, be all things to all people. What drew you to this case to look into it further and to see if you could help Sue Neil Fraser um, get out of jail and have her conviction quashed, given that she was given, how long was the sentence? It was 26 originally. 26 years and then originally. she had one appeal and it was reduced to 23. Right. So what drew you to this case Well, to look into it further? I guess it's funny, you know, you build relationships of trust and respect. And I had that enormously for Mark and his wife, Sarah. Mark, the, Mark, the son-in-law. The son and Sarah. And so when they said, this is awful, and they're very polite, very, you know, they don't scream and yell, I, I would be going out of my mind. They were very, you know, calm, but absolutely traumatised. Mm. And I just thought, look, you know, I thought it could go one of two ways. Maybe she's guilty. I don't know her. Yeah. But with my psychology background, I thought, look, maybe I'll be able to help, you know, come to grips mm -hmm. with a truth situation mm -hmm. that maybe she was guilty. Yeah. So I thought, look, I'm just going to be there for them. And so you flew down it. to Hobart. Yes. When did you do that? I, she was I did that when she in was August two thousand and nine. Literally two weeks later. I okay. I guess look, I asked this simple question. So she left her first husband, Sarah's father, and Sarah has a sister, so two girls, the father and the mother split up Sue. And yeah. I always think does someone have a history? Like she had no criminal history, so there's mm. no not a criminal thing in her background no violent and no violent tendencies. So I thought, did she have an acrimonious split up with her first husband? Mm. And I thought, I wonder what he said when the police interviewed him. So mm. I asked, you know, Brett, his name was lovely guy. Yeah. And Brett, I mean, Brett said the police have to this day never interviewed me and they never did. Yeah. And that blew me away. And I said, well, was Sue ever an angry person? Did you have it? He mm. said, angry? No, she would, she verbally, she could be feisty, but he said, yeah. never would she lay a finger or whatever. And I just thought, well, why wouldn't they look at the previous relationship? Right. And so that was my first thing. And I mm. guess as a psychologist, I kind of look at the history of relationships and violence in families yeah. and domestic violence yeah and I thought well there's none of that the kids were absolutely convinced she hadn't done, done this it. yeah um but she had there was one very significant lie that a lot of people could not get over and what was that the police said w were you at home last night when the boat was sinking and she said yes but in fact she had gone down to the foreshore because the most bizarre thing happened at 10 o'clock at night, Bob's on the yacht and she gets a strange phone call from somebody she doesn't even know mm -hmm. asking for Bob. And right. she said, look, Bob's not here. And the person said, well, I want to speak to him. Mm -hmm. um, and it turned out that this guy had this bizarre story about something awful is going to happen to the boat and it might sink and it right. could be hurt. Right. And it, it was just the most prophetic Yes, phone call. very strange. Really and she strange. went down to the foreshore. And she went down to the foreshore because she'd left her car there. Yeah. And, it, and the phone call was from somebody who was a friend of Bob's mm. daughter with a mental illness who was yeah. prone to, um, you know, some paranoid... Um, yeah. beliefs sometimes or some concerns or whatever. Yeah. So Sue was more worried, less about Bob, but more about the daughter yeah. and thought, I need to have the car. And she does a lot of walking to and from yeah. the foreshore. So she walked down, she looked out, she couldn't see the yacht. It was a very dark night. It was the yeah. darkest night of the moon yeah. season. It was a, a new yeah. moon. It was, there was no light. Mm -hmm. 
she couldn't see anything. She saw some homeless people mm. to the side. That was later disputed, but it turned out she was right. Yeah. She got in her car. She shone the lights down yeah. there. She saw the homeless people. She drove back and, and went what home. She but she made the mistake of saying to the police, no, I wasn't there. And in her head, she thought, look, it's not relevant. They've got to just go and right. find. Right. But, but had she said that, right. I, I think things would have been very different. Yeah. Now, Eve and I have tried to discuss in the last 10 minutes what Eve ended up putting into a six-by-one-hour television series that was on Channel 7. So this is a very multi-layered story with a lot of characters, a lot of information, and enough actually to fill a six by one hour television on Channel 7, which was on in, in mid last year. So, so you know, it's, it's very hard in this conversation, particularly for people who haven't seen the series, which is called Undercurrent, the series um, that was on Channel 7 called Undercurrent. It's very hard to conflate all of that information into 10 or 15 minutes, but Eve, what led you to start making, you, you were sort of like an amateur detective or, mm -hmm. you know, suddenly a Miss Marple, and then you thought at the time you want to document it all or yes. did you envisage a series or you just no. had it? No, what, no. What were you in doing? fact, quite the opposite because as a filmmaker, I never shot my own films. Yeah. My camera was for my children and family holidays. But yeah. I took my camera down to Tasmania to document what I could see on the yacht. Yeah. And I took my newly found biological father, which we'll, yeah. come, back we'll to, come back to, who built yachts, built a steel-hulled yacht yeah. like that and had sailed for 15 years to actually go with me to look at the crime scene. And I documented that. Right. And... I just started interviewing people. I found things that already the police hadn't found. Right. And I ended up making, first of all, a feature documentary yeah. of 80 minutes that looked yeah. at the evidence that we'd found and questioned DNA that was found on the yacht that wasn't Sue's, that belonged yeah. to a homeless girl and so on. And I thought, great, I've done that. I've educated the public. And now justice will be served. So that that 80 minute sort of documentary was called Shadow of Doubt, and it was on Foxtel. And when 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 did you make that? Was that was 2013. It was that was 2013. On and then subsequent to that, there was last year the six by one hour series Undercurrent on Channel Seven. So you had an 80 minute documentary called Shadow of Doubt. And then that sort of like expanded into a six by one hour series. So you must have just kept filming and finding out more layers to this I did. very, very multi-layered story. Look, I, I don't know why, and I don't know how many people out there feel this way, but I can't accept a mystery unsolved. I can't accept injustice, having grown up in a Holocaust surviving family. Um, and I just can't leave it as loose ends. And when I thought it's done and dusted after the film, yeah. I just kept questioning and in the end hired the most amazing person who was a former homicide investigator mm -hmm. and investigative journalist called yeah. Colin McLaren, whose book is absolutely incredible. In fact, I've probably got it's, one here. Somewhere. Uh, yes. So for anybody who hasn't read it, you must read this book, Southern, Southern Justice. Southern Justice. Which is all about the Sue Neil Fraser. Now, did, did you have support from, was there like a support group for Sue that sprung up or was, were there like, you know, did civil liberties groups try to step Civil in? liberties has been absolutely amazing from the beginning. And I know that Bill and Chris, uh, who are online now, have been questioning this wrongful conviction right from the start and insisting that there be a royal commission. So civil liberties, in fact, were instrumental along with a couple of other people in getting Tasmania to change a law after 100 years and allow a further right of appeal. 
So they were very important. The Sue Neil Fraser support group have been the most remarkable group of people yeah. who continually have vigils and they are continually meeting mm -hmm. and continually trying to overturn or get people to yeah. listen to the truth and they haven't stopped. And they've got a website, don't they? Yeah, so there's, the... well, there's a, a few websites. There's yes. savesue.com, which can lead you to all the others. Mm -hmm. There's Facebook um, groups. Mm -hmm. There's a petition on change.org. I think if you go to savesue.com, yeah. that's where you can find out more. But I think the thing that distresses me so much and today, especially it's Remembrance Day, is where I feel that Australians this week are probably prouder than most other countries for two reasons. One is the way we've handled our elections compared to others. And the other is the way we've handled the pandemic. Yeah. And those two things are standout. But what isn't stand out, and I'm going to ask you, put it back yeah. onto you, yeah. is our justice system being very slow to act. And when you think about a person wrongfully convicted, and there are so many of them in Australia, mm. I mean, Lindy Chamberlain is one of the bad cases, but there's, you know, Henry Keogh in, in South Australia, 20 years others who've been 10 years, you know, many of them. Sue's been in jail 11 years. I'm horrified that with all the developments in technology and medicine and DNA, all, everything, why forensics. is the legal system so stuck in an old world? Sean, well, 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 Sean. <laughs> well, my answer to that is I did a law degree, not a justice degree, and they're very, very different. So... The law may be very, um, what's the word, have catching up to do as far as, you know, dealing with these wrongful convictions. And from a justice point of view, that's certainly the case. But, like, you know, I mean, the thing is with Sue, so she, she where, is, where is her case at now? Because she's been in jail since 2009 and we're now 2020, so 11 years, and... What is her, are, are you looking for a pardon from the governor? Is no, such a thing no, possible? no, we're absolutely not. We're looking for a complete exoneration. She had an appeal and it failed, but they reduced the years. So right. on that part, which she didn't care about. Because so it that went was from 26 six years. to 23. Right. Big and deal. a non-parole period down to 13 years from, yeah. from 18. Mm but technically she may never get parole because she can't admit, she's not going to say, yes, I did it to walk out of jail. So to get parole, she has to actually say, I committed I'm sorry. the crime. I'm sorry, remorse. Uh, uh, remorse. remorse, remorse. So where she's at is she lost all rights to appeal, luckily and thankfully to the good work of many, a new right of appeal exists now in Tasmania and South Australia, and she was able to put forward a new appeal. The tragedy is she started that process in at the end of 2015, five years ago, and it is still dragging wow. on. And yet we know through a major admission on 60 Minutes of the witness who said, I'm sorry, I was there. Yes, I lied. She was only 15 at the time. She, mm. By the time she went on 60 Minutes, she was 26. And she has now given a statement. And the point is, you might say, well, she's an unreliable witness. She was taking drugs. She mm. lied. Then she said she was there. Then she didn't. She was there. She is anchored to the crime scene by a large volume DNA sample on the deck of the yacht. Yeah. So this should be picked up by the Attorney General or by the yeah. Director of Public Prosecutions, more yeah. rightly so, to say we can see there has been an error, acknowledge it mm. and m let this go. Or so turn that leave to appeal, which Sue won, and now has to go through a full appeal into an acceptance of an appeal. So is the problem, there seems to be a lot of 
um, dragging of feet going on in Tasmania. Is the problem with the police trying to perhaps cover the cover their tracks because they don't want to admit they made mistakes? Is the problem with the legal fraternity? Is the problem with politicians? Where, where or is it a combination of well, all of that? One of the biggest setbacks is COVID, obviously, this year, which means that her lawyers, who are in Melbourne and Perth, couldn't go there and she and they wanted it to be face to face, mm-hmm. not not online. So that's that's this year's problem. Mm-hmm. Previous to that, it was getting all the people together and the courts finding the right times and the you know all the submissions mm. and so on. But one of the big things that happened in three years ago is that the police turned on us, my t- me and my team, mm. and. That was the most frightening era I've certainly experienced where our phones were tapped. Um, My film production company in Sydney, my partners were raided. The police took possession of our footage. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Many things were done. My bank accounts were checked as to who I paid Mm -hmm. money to. I felt like a criminal. And of course, then the police amassed all of this new stuff they arrested a, a lawyer who was involved in mm-hmm. the case and two other people were charged with trying to pervert the course of justice. And those cases have been continuing, yeah. two of them. So there's all this extra stuff going on. Yeah. So what's the best hope for Sue Neil Fraser? Well, that, that in March yeah. they hear, they don't throw out the 15-year-old who's now 26 testimony Mm -hmm. they accept that she was there they accept that she Mm -hmm. says she saw who did it and they Mm -hmm. go and arrest or interview the person who she saw do it and they let sue walk out immediately and let her try and regain i mean the woman was 55 when she was arrested if we try and imagine that i mean 55 she's had three grandchildren while she's been in prison Mm. and no life and yeah. she's somebody who is absolutely remarkable yes i've met her many yeah. times as is her family her a- as is her family and you know she wrote to me twice in the last couple of weeks and was empathizing with me saying you it must be so hard for you in lockdown um, Melbourne is so tough and mm. how are you managing not travelling? You usually yeah. travel, you usually go to restaurants. And I'm thinking she's worried about me in lockdown. Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, so we've got a few questions. Yeah. But, I mean, that that's, you know, that's sort of a good a, a conflation of, yeah, I mean... You know, that's right. She's been in, in lockdown for the last 11 years. And, um, yeah, there seems to be... If people who watch Undercurrent, you'll see there's so much evidence that points to Sue Neil Fraser not having committed the crime that it's almost inconceivable that she actually did. Um, a lot of people have asked, uh, would other wrongfully convicted people support Sue? And I think, look... Lindy Chamberlain is somebody who started a new life in America and, you know, a lot of her life was ruined. Um, Henry Keogh has been supportive and is very supportive and has been involved Mm -hmm. in some events. So, you know, I don't think you can expect people who have had their lives stuffed up to then spend more time on others, but they're very open and very supportive. Gordon Wood has been extremely supportive. Um, there's been a few who have who have contacted and um, been supportive. So that's the answer to that question. Yeah. So so I mean, you know, there are so many cases of injustice that happen. So are you looking more broadly at other cases yes. in Australia? Yes, or? we are. But in what, what sense are you doing that? Um, we've, we're looking at the cases where we you might be able to have an impact so Mm -hmm. there are people contacting us with their cases and where we feel 
we might be able to do something and make a film. Mm-hmm. I've got a great team ready to go. So we, yeah. but we're evaluating what's possible. The problem, as you know, Sean, is it is almost deadly tackling a live legal case to make a film about because you have enormous problems. We weren't able to show undercurrent in Tasmania to this mm. day. Tasmania It has to be geo-blocked. Yes, yeah. it had to be geo-blocked. So yeah. that is really difficult. Yeah, because when um, a case is ongoing, you can't yeah. in, influence a jury in a negative way. At Although least there isn't a jury, so, yeah. you know, it's, so it's, it's, yeah. it's questionable. Yeah. Um, there's been a really good question. Why have the police not followed up the two homeless men that Megan, who's the teenager at the time, identified? Well, they haven't, they did follow up two years after Sue was incarcerated and did a very um, perfunctory interview, which actually gave them plenty of leads, but they let it go and just said, oh, they were drunk and they don't know what they're doing and just wrote it off. In fact, it's in our series. Yeah. So the second part of that question is why is there no police accountability for egregious mistakes made in their investigations. You know, you can look around the world at the small handful of police, judges, um, even jury members, um, defence lawyers and prosecution lawyers who down the track later say, what a mistake was made, this was my part and Mm. I am so sorry, or... I have trouble living with that, but that was what I thought was right. Nobody says anything of the sort in the majority of cases, and in Tasmania, it's zero. There is no reviewing or even consideration to anything having been done wrong to this day. And, in fact, I'm sure if they could find a way to um, prosecute Mm -hmm. more of us, as you know, Mm -hmm. they would. Yeah. Now, let's talk about the series itself. How did you get this? It's very expensive to and time consuming to make a TV series. And there's a lot of ideas I know as a film and entertainment lawyer get presented with with ideas and synopses and pitch documents all the time for series that never get up. So how did this, how did you get this series up? You tell us about the financing and the production of that, eh? Um, I was introduced to a, a brilliant company in Sydney by a mutual friend, and the company's called CJZ, and they are a major producer of many TV series. They do all my... If you Google CJZ, they've done half the stuff on Australian TV. Yeah. They're, they're absolutely amazing, and um, I put it to them and said, look, I've filmed, you know... 80 to 90% of what we need. And they mm. said, well, we we don't do that. We start with the concept and then... Anyway, through a period of very short time, they saw what we'd done, loved it, and went straight to the broadcasters, mm-hmm. made an, a deal with Channel 7, mm-hmm. who were absolutely out of their usual zone, but they Mm. felt strongly about a wrongful conviction, as Mm. has 60 Minutes. 60 Minutes have done three stories on Sue, and I congratulate both Nine and Seven for their care in continuing to try and bring this to the public. But CJZ and we in Melbourne, CJZ in Sydney, worked together and we shot more because we were unravelling as we were yeah. going, especially with Colin McLaren on board. The 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 the, the ho- former homicide yeah. investigator, yeah. investigative journalist. Yeah. And did you always intend for you to sort of be a main participant in your own series <laughs> or did that just evolve like that? No, I didn't intend. And in fact, Shadow of Doubt, the documentary was, you know, you you heard my words maybe twice behind camera asking the Chief Inspector of Police a question. Apart from that, no, I wasn't part of it. Mm. And suddenly I became the main character along with Colin. Yeah, because you're more than a presenter. You're actually 
a participant in the unfolding story, aren't you? Yes, and um, actually it was handy over COVID because I could grow my hair back after tearing it out yeah. from the madness of this yeah. production. Um, but, yes, much more. And it's very hard keeping your eye on producing at the same time as being in a mm -hmm. project yeah. and also, you know, abiding by the law, like the legal challenges. As yes. you know, how many lawyers did we have in, yes. the, in the whole team? We must Looking have had about defamation 10. and e everything. Clearances. It was just constantly. And, you know, Robert Richter, for example, a remarkable lawyer who's yeah. been behind all efforts since the beginning and not even Sue's lawyer. And Sue's yeah. lawyers have been fantastic. Tom Percy, you know, yeah. uh, originally Barbara Etter, who did, mm -hmm. you know, a sensational job, former police, uh, had 30 years police experience. Yeah. And then now Paul Galbley, you know, quite an incredible team. And yet still she's in jail. Yeah. So with the series, you had scores of hours of footage that you had to edit down into six by one hours. So how did you, did you leave stuff out or did you, how did oh, you? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, oh, there is so much left out that I've got enough for a podcast series that would yeah. be unfolding, for example, the fact that there were many other suspicious bodies found in that river around that time. Right, in addition just, to Bob Yeah, Chappell. that couldn't even be in the series. Yeah. Uh, and yet they were older yachtsmen uh, just by the by, that's just one example. Yeah. But there was so much that could not go in it. But I was very fortunate to have a series producer on board who is a close friend, um, Sophie Mayrick, and she's also an editor. And her eye for what goes in, what goes out, how we can do this was mm -hmm. fabulous. So I guess the team and the approach that we had yeah. made a huge difference. And you were working with their legal team yes. and... You know, it was it was very challenging. And when the series was broadcast, as we said, you know, it was broadcast on Channel Seven around Australia, but could not be broadcast in Tasmania. And thankfully, there was the technology to, to enable it. to get around it, so that the series didn't get broadcast in Tasmania. Otherwise, but if that wasn't possible, then for legal reasons, it couldn't have been shown anywhere. Yes, but a lot of Tasmanians found out how to actually how to access, access it. it. And it's now available remarkably to the world. Um, it's being seen in America. I've had I've had fan mail from Florida, would you believe? Yeah. People appalled that this could be happening in Australia. Yeah. Um, and it's on tubi.com, T-U-B-I.com. Yeah, yeah. And so... There are similar sort of investigative, investigative series in the United States and elsewhere. Were you inspired by any of those? Or Oh, absolutely. Making a Murderer um, was the lawyer in that was my hero, is my hero, Kathleen mm -hmm. Zellner. And I went to Chicago three times to meet with her. She is the most amazing wrongful conviction lawyer in the world and has single-handedly exonerated, had, was responsible for 18 exonerations. Wow. And so, you know, seeing the persistence and her ability to just take on one case after another is inspiring. I'm just wondering if maybe we should look at some of the questions. One yeah. of them is, was Colin McLaren targeted and forced to live outside Australia due to his part in uncovering the injustice. Yes, he pretty much was, and he was yeah. absolutely targeted. Um, why are there not more supporters for Sue, given the airplay documentaries and books? I wish I knew the yeah. answer. I, because why? the Lindy Chamberlain thing captured the imagination of the country. But I know. Sue Neil Fraser... And no, no social media then. Yeah. Uh, look, I'm, I, I don't know why. I, one reason is Tasmania is out of sight and out of mind. Mm. And that's why Channel 7, because another network said, oh, no, it's Tasmania, we won't do it. You know, a lot of people discount Tasmania as mm. an important part of Australia. Mm. So part of it's Tasmania, part of it's a grandmother. You know, she's not mm. some young woman 
you know, mm. it didn't have Ayers Rock, a dingo. A baby. You know, no. Mm. As Robert Richter said, it had a dingy. Yeah, dingy, dingy, yeah. <laughs> you know, but, yeah. but I wish, I, I would love people listening to make suggestions for how to get a wider audience because it is, I think, this century's worst wrongful conviction in Australia. It's mm. it's appalling. It's a tragedy. Mm. Now, there's another question. Why wouldn't Ah, that That's was a question the question you can answer. Yeah, actually. the question is why the police prosecutor is not taking into account all the filming that Eve has done and evidence uncovered and use it use it in an ethical manner. And the thing is that maybe the police are well, China the police took all our Save footage. Dates. No, but there's an amazing thing. You can film something and you can bring it to court and it's called hearsay. So mm. you tell me why that's the case. But the reality is we did work with the lawyers and everything that we found that was useful, they could then take talk to that witness, get their statement in mm. a legal way and pull it together. Mm. And one thing was Megan Vass going on 60 Minutes and that was a very compelling thing yeah. and she did a, a an affidavit to go with that. So that was extremely compelling. But I don't think you can possibly imagine the resistance of authorities and what you need to understand is the states govern their own justice systems so mm. and they and they have their own rules so whereas there's lots of checks and balances in Victoria and New South Wales in particular because we have such large populations and there's a lot of peer checking and mm. many checks and balances the smaller states don't have that yeah and I think with the police I, I can't put my head you know I can't speak for the police but I would imagine that they think that if they were to sort of suddenly concede that they had made mistakes, they would feel, you know, they're, they're sticking to their story. And despite the contrary evidence that is has been presented in the, the Undercurrent series. And, and in court. And in court. Because they just feel that, you know, that Sue is, Sue is guilty. Yeah. And okay. it sort of, it doesn't make sense. It defies logic and rationality. But that's just where the police stand on that. Well, I think it's interesting that we have a case quashed yesterday in Victoria because it was found that police had corruptly and and wrongfully yeah. prepared an affidavit and backdated it. Yeah. And the conviction for murdering police yeah. has actually been quashed and that yeah. guy will have a retrial. Yes. But it's not moving in Tasmania. And meanwhile, a murderer is walking free. And yeah. I, I can't believe it. Look, many of you are saying you have been commenting on social media, yeah. and I know you have. And unfortunately, it's the same small group. You know, there's probably 500 or 1,000 people. We have had 20,000, over 20,000 people sign the petition. So if you haven't, please go to savesue.com and share mm -hmm. it because... We want it to get up higher, you know, and say this yeah. is really important in Australia. Yeah. Now, someone's saying that um, um, that there was a recent program on ABC Melbourne, re Lindy Chamberlain version of events, a documentary, asking the question, what we have learnt about how we treat women in the media and the law, this would be a good follow-up program. So the person suggested it. So yes. do you think there is an element that Sue, I mean, it's almost counterintuitive. Sue was this middle-aged woman who had no history of violence and yet she was, you know, convicted yeah. of murder. So how does that, Yes, you know, and, you know, it's interesting. Lindy Chamberlain and Sue Neil Fraser, both there were no bodies. And yet, you know, and there mm. was, so you didn't even have that evidence mm. Um, and there were many similarities yeah. in Sue's case, yeah. like with the blood being assumed to be blood when, in fact, it wasn't. There were no confirmatory tests yeah. like yeah. Lindy had in the car. It was sound deadener, not fetal blood. Yeah. And similarly, in the dinghy, 
in Sue's case, it wasn't blood, but in court it was presented. You know, there were so many, so many. there's so many yeah. details. Yeah. Now, someone's asking or suggesting that it sounds like a royal commission needs yes. to be called yes. in Tasmania, saving face at the expense of an innocent woman. This enraged me. So how, what what would um, what would the mechanism be for the in order for there to be a royal commission? Is it is it a political thing from the premier or? It, it look, I think the more um, names we have on a petition, the better. Many people have called for a royal commission. Robert Richter has twice called for a royal commission. Mm. I believe Bill Rowlings and Chris Klugman from Civil Liberties have both asked for a royal commission mm. twice. I think it's just a volume of people just saying, no, this but is not the Australia Unfortunately, you know, Tasmania is such a small place that if there was a royal commission, you might have political and police pressure and legal pressure. You would almost like need the royal commission, anyone involved with it, not to be from Tasmania. Would well, you agree with that? Exactly. And when they reinvestigated the case, a few years later, after all our questions, they put the original investigators back involved to yeah. investigate themselves. You need outside, fresh people looking at the evidence in the cold, hard light of day. And that's just not happening, whether that's in a royal commission or some other mechanism. So, yeah. So, Eve, um, you know, you've got this background as a psychologist and then a filmmaker. What, what, what projects do you have coming up that you might also be making that um, involve the, the issue of justice and, and um, you know? Well, as a matter of fact, I'm doing a small dementia project um, on elder abuse and the rights. So that's mm -hmm. in the spectrum um, and it mm -hmm. is an interesting project, but a, a kind of baby one. Mm -hmm. And as you know, I made a feature film that was released at the end of last, last year, year at the Jewish International Film Festival called Man on the Bus, which is another whole different story that we don't have time to talk about now, but it involved, it, well, you can say what it involved. Eh? Well, it involved me randomly through a chain of circumstances investigating and discovering that my father was not my father, but in fact, my father was a man that my mother randomly met on a bus when she first arrived in Australia. And had a 15 year affair with. That was totally secret. She never told me she died, blah, blah, blah. And then a doppelganger looking exactly like me came and said, I think I'm your half sister. Yeah. And on it goes. And then it there. goes. And anyway, called it's called Man the on the Bus. But in the, in the film Man on the Bus, your, your, your non-biological father, the father you grew up with, was a Holocaust survivor. Who escaped from the concentration camp, one of the very few in, yeah. in history. And you're did. looking at maybe making a series. Yeah, I'm making a TV series based on that same story. So it's like I do a big project and then I think, OK, that's it. And then I, I keep going. Yeah. And like I'll have to draw the line. I mean, I still want to do a podcast series on Sue. It's very hard to let go yeah. when there's still more story unfolding. Yeah. You know? And certainly with Sue, there's more to, yeah, to tell. Yeah, it's definitely an unfinished story. There's another question. Why aren't... Oh. Uh, down the bottom. Keep going. Um, where are they? Um, okay, so... This um, one? No, no, no. I think go... Uh, yeah, why are the police... Being um, oh, you've answered that. Yeah, it's going. yeah. Um, I just want to know how Eve got into filmmaking and about some of the other films. So <laughs> that was also well, serendipity in a way, wasn't it? It was because I was a psychologist and I happened to be one of the very early ad adopters of using video to train other psychologists in counselling. And I just got carried away with the medium and started making educational films mm -hmm. and then just thought well I'm leaving my government job and I set up my own company so it was a very smooth transition and I've done a range from little business videos animations through to the tv series yeah which did you go to film school or? no in fact no. I tried I applied and was rejected oh. because they said oh you're a psychologist you don't need another yeah. qualification was yeah. you know we need to give it to people yeah. who 
don't want to do it just as a hobby. So but you, you <laughs> over the years, you've been on the board of Film Victoria, yeah, and also the Australian Film Institute. Institute. So you've yep. you've given back to the industry in that way as well. And I was powered along very early in the piece when I got some project money in the government and was able to make a, an educational series. And I worked with a producer who at the time said to me, a very patronising, misogynistic guy, yes. who said, you know what, Eve, you could make a really good production assistant if you wanted to get into the film industry. Right. And I yeah. thought, you... Have no idea. I am going to make more films than you'll ever make. Yeah. And I just sort of think, I wonder how many other people are powered on by negativity because it's almost more powerful than if yeah. things go smoothly. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. That's true. So so if people want to watch Undercurrent, it's still on 7 Plus, is that right? But yes, it's on if you just search Undercurrent and 7, the number the plus, number seven plus, you'll which get is... all six episodes. And I can tell you, by the time you get to episode five and six is when the police actually turn on us. We were really frightened and you can see it. I mean, it's the fear and the things we were filming ourselves when we were frightened, we were hiding things. Mm. We were just really trying to be um, sane. Yeah. Now I've got a more general question. What advice would you give to the people listening and watching through Zoom and Facebook if they want to pursue not just Sue Neil Fraser's issue, but matters of justice? Is there is it just a matter of signing a petition? No, I think or can people be more proactive? There is one good thing. You can join Civil Liberties. Um, it's headquartered in um, Canberra, but it's a very small but very powerful organisation, Civil Liberties Australia, and it's so low cost and it's such a good thing. Their newsletter will tell you the highlights of the injustices in all sorts of ways about rights, human rights, and legal ways cases, people can help. and ways people can help, events that are happening. So that's one. So Civil Liberties is the National Civil Liberties yes. Union, but in Victoria we've got Liberty Victoria, which used to be... Victorian Council of Civil Liberties or something yeah. in that. Are you involved? No, I'm just involved with CLA, Civil Liberties Australia, and right. they have people in each state. Yeah. And I'm just so impressed with the work of mainly two people who just really have done an awesome job. And, and you can say who they are. Yes, I have said Bill and Chris who are yeah. who are here. So if you search on that and join that, it's, you know, a mod, a very tiny fee for being up to date and being involved and I mean thanks to Kathy who also has very important practical yeah. sessions that bring people's attention yes exactly exactly so no that that that's interesting so everyone can make a little difference in some way you don't have to make a six by one hour television <laughs> series necessarily and did you have any, we're going to finish it shortly. Did you have any final comments as to sort of, you know, where you see soon, where do you, how do you think it's going to play out in the next year? Do you know, we've all become so afraid to hope for Tasmania doing the right thing that we know that she should get out soon after the, her appeal starts to be heard in March, mm -hmm. she's got three judges, but so much has gone against Sue and I am so disappointed in Tasmania mm -hmm. that I'm too scared to be hopeful. Yeah. And that's a horrible way. It's, I am such an optimistic person, mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm nervous about how, you know, somehow the rules are very different. The goalposts are not the same. In yeah, Tasmania. and the criminal justice system is specific to each state and territory. Because I was going to say, you know, could you involve the federal attorney general, or that's not. Well, gonna... he's busy. Isn't he's he? busy at the <laughs> moment. He's got his own issues to deal with. <laughs> we've tried. <laughs> <laughs> we've tried. I mean, we've tried. We've tried. We've we've written to um, the prime minister. We've, we've continually, you know, been updating people. 
we also send out lots of Colin's book. This book, if you like reading, this book does Southern Justice so by Colin much. McLaren. And it is such an important book and good on Hachette for publishing it and good on Colin for writing it when he was under such enormous pressure. And yeah. he's still been targeted as but recently as But if it wasn't as as for you, the... Colin wouldn't have been involved. No, I brought him in. You brought him in. In fact, the whole thing about Sue is I know it needs to be even more well-known, a lot more well-known, but if it wasn't for you, Sue would just be forgotten about. I mean... Unless Megan Bass decided and came forward in some way. But, I mean, it took a lot of talking to her. She was she's I mean, very it, afraid. You, you know, I don't want to sort of blow wind into your sails, but, you know, you've just, you know, exposed the whole thing in the media or on the television show, you inspired, inspired books. How many other Sue Neil Frasers are sitting in jail right now where there's no TV series, no book, no chats on Facebook or Zoom? I know. It's frightening. It's frightening. Look, Robin Bowles has written a lot about mm. various cases and she's been a very strong advocate of Sue and she's got other cases that she's written about. So was she the lawyer? or No, she's the author. Robin the author, yeah, yeah. The yeah. author. So she's written a book, Death on the Derwent. Yeah. Um, and, oh, another great place that you should go is <laughs> we're seeing signs free Sue now. What we should start is you know, save Sue or freight, free Sue now signs all over Australia, take mm. photographs and send them in. Mm. Um, mm. But we definitely should mention Andrew Urban, who mm -hmm. is a, a wonderful guy who got totally, he, he had Urban Cinephile. The, the journalist. The journalist. And he used to review films and he had, he built a business of 20 years he reviewed Shadow of Doubt and flipped out and said, this couldn't be, this can't be. Mm. And he has become obsessed with wrongful convictions. Mm -hmm. He does an amazing newsletter. Please all write this down, wrongfulconvictions.org or search wrongful convictions, Andrew Urban, U-R-B-A-N. Um, he's also done a terrific book, mm -hmm. Murder by the Prosecution. Uh, again, mm -hmm. about Sue's case and about some of the other cases. Mm -hmm. He is someone who absolutely puts forward a lot about the injustices in Australia and it's the first newsletter of its kind and mm -hmm. he's putting out articles every week. Now, so did Sue know this was happening tonight, this <laughs> discussion? No, I'm going to write to her and get snapshots of things that to tell yeah, her. Yeah, great, and that's allowed to be communicated even in a though. letter you can all write letters to sue neil fraser care of risden prison and she will be absolutely delighted um mm. she she just sends such beautiful letters i'll show you. i won't yeah. show you she's a painter now as well and she does beautiful artwork and wow she's just incredible but don't send her books wow because oh there's somebody who's got a um a sue artwork which is yes, great, great. She's, she just does gorgeous artwork Right. And um, but you can't send her books or gifts or anything because it'll just be sent back. Yeah, and of course, you know, thank God we don't have the death penalty in Australia because oh. can you imagine over, you know, when the death penalty was around, she'd be gone. Yeah, it's terrible. It's terrible. Well, you know, thank you, Eve. You are an absolute inspiration, and um, hopefully, this story will. Well, even if Sue gets let out of jail tomorrow, she's had 11 years in jail. So I was going to say, hopefully this story will have a happy ending. It will always be tinged with, you know, it shouldn't have been, but hopefully there's some justice in the end. As I said, I only did a law degree. I didn't do a justice degree, but I know injustice and justice when I see it. And this is a real injustice. Mm. Yeah. I think that's a great line to come back to me because we all know when we see justice and when we see injustice, and that's what impact is all about. And what we've got these people amazing <coughs> you to joining us on Impact Chat to talk about different stories, big injustices and little injustices. I think we could have listened to you for another hour and a half or two without taking a breath. I want to thank you both so much for this evening. Thank you, um, Eve. I'm going to ask you to, after this is over. 
to send me all those details and we will write that up on our Facebook page underneath the video so that everybody can have a chance of following up on all of those things. Um, Sean, you said everybody can make a little difference and I often think when I think about that, you know, people say, well, what can I do? Well, they've obviously never been in a room at night in summer with one mosquito flying around. Yes. A little thing can be a big thing. We can all do something. And you talked about when that, I've forgotten who it was, who said to you you'd make a really good production assistant and how that spurred you on. Yes. We went to the same school and the maths teacher, who will, shall remain nameless, but you probably know, at the end of year 12, she said to me, Kathy, you're a sweet girl, but you'll never amount to anything. Oh, and my, my goodness. Uh, Ten years later at our reunion, she said, Kathy, what did you end up doing? And I said, Mrs. Mm-hmm. I became a really good maths teacher. <laughs> <laughs> good. 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 Friends, next week, we don't have an impact chat, but we do have our AGM. Now, a lot of organisations and charities have really struggled this year with COVID. We've actually flourished and got new programs and done some wonderful things, so I'd love you to join us to hear all that. The week after, we're back again, and we have a team of people who we'll be speaking to. The, The key person is a Vietnamese student, or was a Vietnamese student, called Min, and he was became the victim of a random racial attack and was left for dead. His story is devastating, it's heartbreaking, it's inspiring, and it's courageous all at the same time. And it, a, a theatre show has been developed from it. So we'll be hearing from, from Min, from the author, from the person he calls his guardian angel. And those of you who've been to our Rap and Pack days will know Laurie, who is one of our key entertainers there, He had a major role in the theatre performance and we might get a song out of him as well. So I'm really looking forward to seeing you all then. Till then, please, everybody, stay well, stay safe and see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye.